So before the children come up and receive their Bibles, I did something to all their Bibles, to all of them. I turned them into butterflies. Now all they have to do is look in their Bible and they will see what I'm talking about. But for me, I always play around with things. So butterflies mean this, listen to this. Beautifully useful, terrifically tender followers of a loving Yahweh. And thus, we are butterflies. So before we hand these Bibles out, I would ask you to stand. And just raise your hand as if you're blessing it. And repeat after me. God of imagination, imagination. bless these sacred books books. with your Holy Spirit Spirit. and give them to children children. that they might know your mind and your way. way. And let us all say, "Thank thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. We'll hand them out. What we're going to do is we're going to call your name out and we invite an adult who wants to come with the individual child to come forward. And there's names on here and you can pick up your own Bible. We're trying to be as good as followers of CDC rules as we can be, okay? Lila Naktra will be uh, joining us next week for her blessing. Lauren Astry. You have to find your Bible, hon. Congratulations, Lyle. Thank you, Lauren. Noah Sherman. Axel Vinay. Ava Whiteman. Logan Burchin. Caden Lewis. Xander Naparala.
online. I can no longer uh, stay at home. And so I uh, found a very nice facility for you in the community and uh, very sad and getting a little depressed because we lost the sight, we couldn't see it. And uh, we uh, finally had a kind of despair state, the only body we got. I'm not on. Okay, so there was this guy, older gentleman who went blind. Her, tell, stop me if you've heard this story before. And, and uh, they decided he had to go in a facility because they couldn't take care of him. The family loved him dearly, but just the same. But once he was there, blind, unable to do much of anything, he began to get very depressed. Then he got a new roommate. Now, there's nothing wrong with his roommate's eyesight, and but the roommate could no longer walk. Um, and he was right next to the window. So one day, the older man who was blind said, can you tell me what you see outside? The guy said, well, sure, I'll tell you what I see outside. And he began to tell him, you know, he's about a mail carrier and the dog that chased the mail carrier, all that kind of stuff. And, and you know, and, and uh, you know, about these two teenagers who seem to be starting one of those first relationships, you know, they were walking, talking to each other, and then, and then as the, he got on with the story, would, later on they started holding hands, and you know, you know how it goes, you know, and he, he wove the story, talked about the cat that always ran out of the house, you know, you know because he, they'd open the door and the cat out the door, and then the neighbors and everybody would be chasing this cat, trying to catch it, and he just kept going on and on with these stories, and it really changed the way the guy could, could live. He just listened to these stories about the people outside uh, in uh, the neighborhood. But he, this man who could see was more ill than the other guy knew. And during the night, he died. And soon after that, he got a new roommate. He said to his roommate, you know, I don't want to bother you, but could you tell me once in a while what, what it looks like, what's going on outside? And the man said, well, sure, I'd be more than willing to do, you, do that to you, but the only thing that's outside our windows is a brick wall. There are people and congregations, no matter where I've gone, this holds true, by the way, that tend to skip stones across the waters of life. Some of them put on snorkels and go beneath the surface of the waters. And there are those who put on wetsuits and dive beneath its surface in order to discover new ideas and opportunities. You must hear this. There is value in each of those. Those who skip stones across the water help us to make it through the day-to-day -day practical aspects of life. Those who snorkel, touch the surface, and see beneath life helping to show where a stone may have fallen short. And those who dive beneath the surface of the water, well, they they can fill our imaginations with wonders that we may not be able to see. The problem is that often those folks are looked upon with suspicion, or occasionally, when their dream seems too wild, put in their place. Now here's the catch. Whenever we stop people from diving into the waters and plummeting to the depths of life, we lose a portion of life itself. Those who swim beneath the waters need to come to the surface to survive and to enjoy the campfire and fellowship of others skipping stones. And those who stand above skipping stones need the others to remind them there is more to life than we can easily see by merely looking at the surface. Both are needed. All three are needed. As I come to the end of my career as a pastor, 
I still believe there are two things that have become a problem for the church, big church, and for most congregations. The first is that many congregations fail to mentor another generation into positions of leadership. The leaders get so concerned about doing what they have always done that they hold tightly onto their ideas and ways of doing things. There are times people get so afraid of offending someone that when change is needed, there is no one raised up to do something and so part of the congregational life just stops. And some hold so tightly onto the ways of doing something that no one can even pry something from them until their hands are cold from death. Usually, that is too late for any organization because many of the youngest see that their ideas will never be accepted by their elders. So they do what they can. They leave. The other is related. It is the loss of imagination. Imagination is not just for play. The imagination is among the chief glories of the human. When it is healthy and energetic, it ushers us into adoration and wonder into the mysteries of God. When it is neurotic and sluggish, it turns people into parasites, copycats, and couch potatoes. Right now, one of the most essential Christian ministries in and to our own world is the discovery and exercise of the imagination, that sacred, holy imagination. Ages of faith have always been ages rich in imagination. It's easy to see why, you know, the gospel has this materialism to it, this solidness to it. It's, it's got the things that you can see and hear and touch like Jesus. But no less impressive is its spirituality where it talks about faith and hope and love. Imagination is the mental tool we have for connecting the material and spiritual, visible and vis invisible, earth and heaven. Imagination enables us to play with our future. It empowers us to trust in the promises of God. It sees Jesus in the lives and the eyes of others. It aids us as we seek to do the will of God in the world. It sees in the darkness of our times and lives the promises of God and the light of Christ. It lets us see ourselves most importantly as the children of God. If there is anything in this world that has saved my life, it is that image I have in my head that I am God's child. Sometimes spoiled. Sometimes a little nasty. But when it's all said and done, I remain the child of God. And I must see that to believe it. I heard someone from this congregation share an aspect of that person's faith journey. I thought, I thought to myself, this is the imagination of faith that lets the reality of Jesus into our lives. This person shared that whenever there is such that time when something is a little questionable in their life, that they, they imagine asking Jesus who's with them. You want to do this with me? Now, as I listened to this person say that, I thought, man, how many bar fights would I have avoided if I had taken Jesus in with me? For a variety of reasons. 
It is an example of imagination and faith joining hands and marrying one another and becoming one. We tell our children to grow up, and by that we often mean join our world and settle for it. But Jesus didn't tell us to grow up, did he? What did Jesus tell us to become? To become like children. And to be filled with imagination and wonder and newness. My father got mad at me. I mean really mad, dangerously mad at me once. I was out playing in the leaves with a little boy from next door. We were building those little forts out of the leaves, you know. And then, then I would take all the leaves and I'd pile them up and I'd, then I would, I just love doing this, by the way, and I would throw him into them, up in the air. He's really light, too, by the way, and the leaves are really full. And he would land in the pile and his laughter would just... Phenomenal. It was just crazy. My dad came out and said, David, stop doing that. You're embarrassing me. No man should behave like this. No, I shouldn't have been having to do this. But this little boy's older brother was an intruder in our house from my dad's 45, the same 45 who would stick in my gut eventually always with a clip and always with a round in. And he went into my bedroom and right where I would be laying and my heart would be, he pulled the trigger. And by chance, I happened to walk in on him. He would be arrested, but eventually he would find another gun. And he would go and rob a 7-Eleven put that gun to the cashier's throat and pull the trigger. That little boy needed another model, another image in his life. And I said to my father, I've never forgotten the words, I looked him straight in the eyes and I, you didn't do that with my father, he was alpha. And I looked him in the eyes and I said, because I can do this, I will always be more of a man than you are. We gather here each Sunday because we imagine what God has done for us. We hear what God has done for us. We, we taste a future feast prepared for us. Our, our imaginations enliven our faith and inform our behavior as we remember that God still acts in our lives and in the world. And God whispers a word of acceptance and love into our lives while feeding our spirit and our hope. William Williamon would say this, Christians believe that God's salvation is of all creation. It's cosmic, it's large, yet none of this is self-evident to the world. So we gather on a weekly basis to testify that the resurrection of Jesus Christ has changed the world. To tell and to embody a story the world cannot know apart from the witness of the church. The very precariousness of the church's existence today in this culture requires faith on our part to say that God is really in control of history, that God will not be mocked, and that the purposes of God shall not forever be thwarted. We need vision. We need imagination. It's not hard to get things done. Imagination must come before implementation. Our entire culture is competent to implement almost anything and to imagine almost nothing. There is a danger 
when we stop imagining that holy stuff of life and existence and of the church. Now, where would we be if we're not for those among us who push the limits, who question the rules, who refuse the can'ts and nevers, and dare to dream new dreams? As Helen Keller once said, no pessimist ever discovered the secrets of the stars or sailed to the uncharted land or opened a new heaven to the human spirit. Imagination should be honored and uplifted and upheld, encouraged so that the dreamers can dream and the workers have something to work for. We handed out this book. It is just a book, by the way. When people ask me, well, what do I do with the book when it's old and tattered? I say, recycle it? What makes this book holy, what makes this book sacred, is how it touches our heart, our mind, and soul. I know many people who have great knowledge of this book, who can recite you passages, have done their Greek and Hebrew, who can tell you about Sinai. I can't, by the way. But they cannot imagine that God loves them, that Jesus died for them, rose for them, saved them, and change them. Parents, what a holy job you have to do. To read that book, to share those stories, to let the imagination go, because without imagination, we cannot see Mary wobbling on her feet, held up by the disciple tears in her eyes and watching her son, her firstborn, die. Without imagination, we cannot be there when Mary Magdalene hears her name called out by Jesus and she turns and she sees her resurrection Lord and she says, Roboni. Without imagination, we cannot see the great sea parting and the Israelites marching across, going on a journey to the promised land. Without imagination, we will become lost, stagnant, and stuck in the mud. With imagination, everything changes.